try to continue with the petri nets we look at two more examples and then we will stop at that point right okay so now let us try to so what do we do with this uh, ctmc we talked about uh, right taking the stochastic petri net and then generating the corresponding markov chain model from that so the benefits are that we can use the steady state right behavioral remember with the, we can start we can solve this um, markov chain in terms of steady state properties if it meets some conditions we have discussed that uh, earlier on right so we can use the steady state behavior values of ctmc can be used for performance evaluation so they can be used for performance analysis so that is the main advantage of looking at this particular class of stochastic petrinets okay and in general what we do is we can associate every marking in the system right every possible marking basically the state space that we are referring to each marking of the spn with some sort of reward value this is what we used to do when we try to find out the expected number of customers in a queue right so for example we said state 0 the reward is 0 state 1 reward is 1 and so on then we try to find out the expected number of customers by saying sigma reward into corresponding probability so likewise we can define some any arbitrary function when we looked at uh, markov chains for queuing theory that was just uh, the number of the um, state spaces uh, each state's reward was simply the number of customers buffered in the system at that point in time where it can be any generic function that you want right so we can define some sort of reward function you associate that with the spn and then obtain an average an average reward based on the probability distributions of the markings so this is a very generic statement we won't actually look at an example of this but in the previous example that we saw right i had three states where we solve for uh, p1 p2 and p3 i can simply state that the probability of rate right, reward can be um for example state uh, the reward of in being in p1 which is both units being operational right is very very high so it's like a million dollars for both of them to be operational and uh, if both of them are down and the corresponding reward is like i don't know very very small right zero or something like that right some negligible amount and even if one of them is operational it is still right relatively uh, the, the reward for that is going to be fairly low then if you do that then you try to calculate the effective reward on the system right so by looking at uh, by those looking at p1 p2 p3 multiply by the corresponding rewards will get you the mean reward for the system and you have to tune your lambda and mu that's the ultimate objective right if you are going to tell that uh, this the system will fail every 100 units of time that is actually probably not acceptable so you'll have to say make it more reliable right this is used for reliability design to in improve the uh, components make sure that all the components work better you get reliable components and things like that right so that the mean time to failure should be fairly low when people design cars they are deal this all the time right or even flight uh, planes for example you have to make sure that collectively the plane right does not just um, conk off in the middle of flying you have to make sure that all the components have such high reliability that overall reliability is fairly high so this that's why we have four, two engines and four engines right this is similar thing if two engines uh, the reason having two engines at least one of them is working at least you can fly so that's the idea of this reward so you can associate any reward function you want to with all the states compute the overall system reward and then use that for evaluation for further redesigning the system or for whatever other operations right that's for performance tuning or for you know adding capacity to the system and things like that same thing you can look at rewards in the cost in the context of uh, uh, buffers for example right if you have less buffers in the system occupied that means maybe less power is getting consumed so you want to keep the power consumption low and keep the number of you know keep the buffer occupancy is fairly low so there are lots of uh, you know metrics that you can uh, you can do for example uh, you can measure right we can measure the the average number of tokens right that are there in a given place this can be measured through that uh, solving the ctmc model right or you can look at the average number of times a transition is fired right so how often do we use a particular transition right that that will give that will be obtained from the corresponding uh, state transition matrix if you want to from transition is fired because we want to see right when you write uh, we talked about 
uh, applications of vetri nets one of them is also in software design right in uh, system design software design in particular you want to make sure that you have lot of if then else statements right and the probability of going to a particular if then else if else class is very very low you want to see what's the probability of going actually executing that else class if that is very low there is no point in optimizing that particular piece of code right that's another way of looking at it so vetri net is also used in the context of software design for large scale systems so you should look at that and the third of course right we always we always care about delay so we can try to find out the average steady state delay which we know how to do right if i find out the number of um, customers at a given point in time in a given subsystem then with little slow i can translate that into the delay also right so the average steady state delay in traversing a sub network so all of these are interesting things to consider etc okay so now let us look at uh, a simple example where we can actually do a little bit uh, more sophisticated uh, computations okay <coughs> so what we solved earlier was a very basic three uh, three state system let us go for a slightly larger system okay all right so now this is a we are writing a program okay i'm writing a program <coughs> which we we are going to make it a parallel program or at least a two thread program multi threading okay and this is at the application level so um, let us say that you know that there is this is main right this place refers to your main program and a token being present here indicates that there is some input value right so whenever you get an input value this is like running your main program in some sort of a while uh, endless for loop right the idea is that initial some value for x is n and x are given i talked about n x right so this could be two values right so this represents this token represents a tuple x and n two values are read from the keyboard or default values are there in your program already and you want to compute whether x of n is bigger or n of x is bigger that's the task to consider so now this is becoming a parallel program right so what happens is so there is we have a transition which uh, again is assumed to be exponentially distributed with some parameter mu1 so this is some basic some pre processing that you have to do right it could be something more if in the in this case probably not much pre processing is needed but it could be maybe reading a database getting some right necessary values that you are computing from the system and then you are going to do this processing in parallel we talked about that a little bit earlier too right so after processing these two tokens are copied to both these places so this is a case of where the data is getting copied right so this is one thread this is another thread and this line this transition represents the processing time for this particular thread okay and let us say that this thread takes time mu2 for right the rate of processing is mu2 rate of processing is mu3 for that thread all right so then after processing it is uh, you know we say that it is the data is completed so this may be computing uh, x of n and this is computing n of x okay so now the data is available there so we will call these states now that is main this is p1 this is p2 and this place can be called p1f and this state can be called p2f okay and then we have no wrong so this is your join operation right so that these two sets come together and uh, that is where the transition is and this is computation comparing these two values doing some processing post getting the data from those two so then after that this could also include some input processing right so what we do is this uh, mu4 could be output result and it could also have something like read x and from the keyboard or from some file or something like that right therefore there's some amount of time is required and when this is done we go back to main that's all this is a main loop right so at any point in time only one data is getting there's only one token in the system right or uh, we will see actually there more than one token because of replication okay but this is the um, behavior of this program right so the, uh, the left side computes uh, does some computation right side does some other, some other computation we join it and then we send it back now i want to find out how fast can i process numbers in this particular system where is the bottleneck okay i want to right see the rate at which i can process data in the system that's going to be throughput right i want to see the rate of processing of data in this particular system 
So, how do we translate this S p n? This is assuming that all those uh, times are exponential, how shall we translate this S p n into a corresponding C T M C and then if can we solve for the value that I want throughput is what I am interested in right or we can also compute delay, we can say what is the time average time taken for a packet to go through this entire um, right for while loop computation. Okay. So, now what will be the state space for this particular system, what are all the possible markings? Where all can you find right tokens? Remember at one point only one n x is there, right. So, what are all the different um, places of having tokens? So, we will call the state one token is at main. So, when a token is at main can there be token anywhere else in this system? No, not there. Okay. Then where else can tokens be? So, here I am doing replication right same data is going to P 1 and P 2. So, it is possible that I have tokens at P 1 and P 2 right that is also possible. <coughs> because that is when this mu 2 right transition is happening. So, only after some time will mu 2 and mu 3 finish right, then what are the other combinations at? It is possible that P 1's computation is finished and data is sitting here, but this transition cannot be fired until this other part of the computation is finished. So, therefore, here I have data this is still sitting here because this computation is not finished yet therefore, it is P 1 f and P 2 that is another possible marking for the system right. And likewise the corollary where P 1 the data is sitting here this is finished computation therefore, it is P 1 and P 2 f ok. Any other place these two P 1 f and P 2 f. Okay. Any other combination? this is the only possible combination right. So, these are the 5 possible states of my Markov chain. Okay. Now, let us draw the state uh, transition diagram for this particular system. So, we call so we call the state right. So, state 1 to state 2 what is the rate of transition? I guess we need to go back here right. State 1 to state 2 is mu 1 that is the rate is mu 1 ok. So, that is mu 1 then 2 to 3 so, this is when P 1 is finished and sitting in P 1 f, but P 2 is still processing. Therefore, the rate for transition is simply mu 2 and from here I can also go to the case where P 2 is finished sitting in P 2 f, but P 1 is still processing and the rate for transition for that is mu 3. Then from 4 where can I go to? So, from state 4 right. So, let us look at. So, there was a packet here and a packet here right what will happen? I will have to only move to the state right where there is packets in both the cases. Likewise, when there is a packet here and a packet here when this packet comes here I will be coming over here right. So, so to go from um, P 1 f and P 2 to P 1 f and P 2 of the rate is mu 3 right. Therefore, to go from 3 to 5 the rate is mu 3 and to go from 4 to 5 where the packet is here, token is here and token is here to go to this state it is rate mu 2. So, we have mu 2 for this change mu 3 here right these are the rates and then when it this finishes I go back to the original state main state with rate mu sorry that was mu 4, mu 4. That is my CTMC. Now, this I can solve right, I can feed this to any Markov chain solver. We can also solve this by hand right, it is uh, fairly straightforward to do that. So, what are the state balance equations again right, it is going to be simply mu 1 
p 1 equals. So, this is if I am in p 1 rate of departure is mu 1 p 1, what is the rate of coming back? mu 4 p 5 and then mu 2 um, p 2, right. So, if I am in mu 2 rate of departure is mu 2 p 2 and the rate of arrival is is um, u 1 into p 1, no sorry, where do I arrive in here? No, oh, sorry, no, that is not right. If I look at this one, if I look at um, P2, I can leave with rate mu 2 as well as there is also right mu 3 P2. These are the two departures arriving is mu 1 P1 and so forth. Okay. Now, we can pretty much solve for all of this, and then now if I am interested in the throughput of the system. I can just write down the equations for this. Actually, we can we do not need a solver for that. Manually, you can just write down and equate all the p1 values, and you will find that you know p1 can be solved for. And once you solve for this, the throughput of the system is given by what? How will we define the throughput of the system? Throughput of the system is defined when whenever main is able to process the new data item, right. So, when will what is the rate of um, a new data item getting processed by main? Whenever you are passing data to that P2, P3, right. So, the probability of being in state p 1, which means you have entered main and the rate of leaving, right, amount of processing that p 1 has to do. So, that will be given by mu 1 into p 1, this will be the throughput of the system. Okay. So, if mu 1 equals 5 and p 1 is 0 0.1, then it will be 0 0.5 is the effective throughput of that particular system. Okay. So, if mu 1 not convinced? would it be mu 4 into mu 4 into p 1. No, p 1 is the probability of being in that state, right. So, the problem, so it will be also mu 4 into p 5, yes, by this, because it does not matter, right, because that is our um, mu 1 p 1 or mu 4 p 5 will be the same, right, <laughs> but because that is our balance equation, right. So, one or the other, we can solve for anywhere p 1 p 2, you will basically solve for all the probabilities and then you will essentially take mu 1 p 1 or mu 4 p 5 whatever that you find can be right, but that is the rate of which you will leave that state to go to the next state. That means, that the next processing is happening, okay. that is the way we will define your throughput. Mu 4 into mu 4, why is it mu 4? Mu 4 into p 5 is the probability of going in, not mu p 1. So, you see p 5 is here, right. So, if you are in state 5, Right, which is when you have you have obtained all the results for those two p 1 f p 3 to f, you have now finished your processing with rate mu 4, you are going back to state 1, the main state. Right, That can also be considered as returning back to main, but by our balance equation it is the same as mu 1 p 1. So, if I am currently in state p 5 and I have finished my processing all the getting the next data, right? I want to find out when the next data can be processed. So, this is that will be either mu 4 into p 5 or mu 1 into p 1. You have, to, you have to work it out there. Okay. So, now if I want to find out the delay on the system, how will you do that? If I want to find out the average time taken by a packet to go through this, what will be the, how will you compute the delay value? 1 by 1 by mu over 1 over throughput will be the, um, the total delay in the system, 1 over throughput. 1 over mu 1 p 1, what is that correct? What is the expected number of jobs in the system? Expected number of jobs in the system is exactly 1, <laughs> right. 
when there is only one job in the system that is circulating right. So, if I use little's law can I use little's law here will you get that still 1 over mu 1 p 1 you will get that right as you are finishing if your throughput is basically whatever 10 jobs per second right that means that and so on average you will be requiring 0.1 unit of time per job right delay will be simply 1 over mu 1 into p 1. If I use little's law what will I do I will try to find out the what is the what is the arrival rate into the system. According to little's law right it will be e of n which is 1 divided by the effective arrival rate into the system right and what is the effective arrival rate mu 4 into p 5 which is also mu 1 into p 1 what is therefore delay equals 1 over mu, mu 1 right. So, delay is going to be 1 over mu 1 into p 1. So, that we can figure out right by by just uh, solving for those particular equations <coughs> ok. So, questions on on this and you want a homework on more complicated modeling problems homework no homework. I presume that you do not want any homeworks ok. okay. So, we are pretty much uh, winding down right. So, there are um, several tools available, but I, I have not tested this right I mentioned pipe. So, pipe is a tool where you can actually input uh, with the graphical interface right. So, this is uh, available in source forge. I am not sure to what extent it is uh, professional extent it is professional and well maintained but it is out there if you look at it it says it is a bunch of MSc projects from Imperial College in London. So, about 4 or 5 years of our M tech equivalent projects have been done in trying to make this right. So, we could also do that here if you needed to. So, that is uh, one particular system that is there I have not yet uh, tried the other ones, <coughs> uh, but you should look at uh, you know in fact there is something called uh, uh, Petrinet markup language is also there markup language is also been defined, but if you look at the Wikipedia page it seems to be defunct I am not sure what the status of that is, because people wanted to have a simple way to write the specifications for a petri net and then give that to any simulator any tool it will take that. Otherwise what happens every tool has its own way of representing the data of inputting data and things like that. If there is a common markup language then you can always port it between different systems. Like ultimately what do you have you just want to specify the set of arcs and transition and uh, right transitions and and the places in that particular system. So, there is some something also that uh, you can look at ok. So, besides this people have uh, been fairly active it is a relatively active community um, that is out there. Um, so, there are extensions called colored petri nets ok. So, the default petri nets you have seen is all tokens are the same. So, colored petri net simply means that you will have different data types. So, different tokens will different types of tokens exist where each token corresponds to a different data type and uh, then you can solve for those right. So, colored petri nets there is a book and lots of books have been, uh, are available then uh, other things. Um, so, even the GSP and I talked about can be even further extended right with the non exponential delays also right. We talked about exponential delay or immediate triggering, but there are possibilities of um, other types of uh, delay distributions are also possible and then we have uh, something called fluid SPNs which I have not yet looked into right, but if you look at the Wikipedia page for um, uh, petri nets in general right there are lots of extensions out there ok. So, in summary this seems to be a useful tool right sometimes it is easy to represent a system in the con this almost like a looks like a flow chart right it is like a flow chart representation only thing it is precise and the semantics are well defined. So, you can take that you can feed it and then uh, right, you can potentially also simulate it if you have to with those specifications and um, so yeah. So, that is uh, it is a useful tool, but unfortunately there is no time to actually try it out in the context of this course at least, but we can probably add an exercise for somebody to try it out.